Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much just for another day to be alive and by your grace and mercy uh, having another chance to glorify you today. And we do this, Father, by fellowshipping in your word together. This is one way that we praise you and we honor you. We give thanks to you. Help us never take this beautiful thing for granted. Father, we also right now pray for those in our congregation who are sick and who are struggling, who can't be here today. We ask that you bless them in their spirit especially. Let them know that we are with them in spirit and we long to see them again face to face for your will, of course. And Father, most of all, we thank you for Jesus Christ. Your son became a man 2,000 years ago to do something unthinkable and totally undeserved, totally sacrificial, so that we could live with you forever in heaven because he paid our debt on the cross so that whoever believes in him will be saved by your grace. Father, please bless this message right now. Help us all be in the moment. Help us concentrate on your word. Help us listen for your spirit and what you're trying to say to each one of us today. We ask all these things based on the merits of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ alone. By the power of the spirit, we pray. Amen. All right. Proverbs 17, Wisdom, Part 88. So first of all, I want to uh, officially thank Pastor Collins for the opportunity to fill in for him during his sabbatical. Um, I think I've been remiss up to this point, actually. But it's an honor and a privilege to share the Word of God, especially from a God-fearing pulpit like this, and especially for people that really want to hear the Word. And that's why we mustn't take what we have here at North Christian Church for granted. Um, this is rare. This is pretty rare. Uh, as more and more churches even go away from the truth, uh, there are certainly other churches that teach truth. But it's becoming more and more rare to have a ministry so committed to teaching the truth of God's word in integrity and humility. Do you know what I'm saying? That's, really the, that's a really, unfortunately, a fairly unique thing these days. And also to have a flock that actually wants to hear the word of God without any compromise, without any strings attached. Um, I was talking to someone about that yesterday and how much they appreciated that about this church. So it's a real blessing. And um, we should just not ever take this for granted. So here's a little encouragement for you all as we begin today, courtesy of the Spirit. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> we should always be thankful because this could be gone tomorrow. We have absolutely no idea what God's plan might be next for us. So enjoy it while we got it. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 1. Through four. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. So may God speak to you this morning, whatever you just needed to hear in that passage. Be encouraged. Again, let's just read verses 3 and 4. We had always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, 
and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. What a compliment. And I can, I, you know, it's true about our church. It's awesome to see a lot of growth, a lot of love, and, and we're increasing. We're on the right vector, you know what I mean? That whole conversation. We're going in the right direction. Nobody's perfect, but we're increasing in faith and love, which is pure and wonderful, you know? Anyway, God is good and we are blessed. On Thursday, we opened up with the idea of looking out for one another's souls. Um, of course, this is what love does. We were exhorted from the scriptures to exhort one another, and for a very good reason. So turn in your Bibles again to Hebrews 3, verse 12. Hebrews 3, verse 12. We saw again on Thursday that we are to encourage one another each day so we don't fall away from the faith carelessly listening to voices of doubt, either in our own heads or from others' mouths. Look at Hebrews 3, 12 and 13. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. In other words, watch out for evil, which is unbelief at its core, right? The fool has no fear of God, that's unbelief. Watch out for that evil mindset. Don't give the devil a room in your soul because he wants one and he's going to henpeck at you to try to get one. But verse 13, exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin very powerful warning to pay attention to. Recall past this series on the deceitfulness of sin a couple years ago, which is available on the website to listen to again. Sin will try to deceive us, to trick us away from faith in the Lord. That's Satan's major objective, away from faith in the Lord, to get us to doubt. So don't fall for it. When you see it start happening, don't even entertain it. You know? You know when you get those whispers in your ear and you hear, you know, is this really true? Or what about this, right? What about that? Let's do this to Satan. La, 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 la. Right? I'm not listening. I'm not listening. Lord, help. In that moment, you know what I mean? Be alert. Don't let that overtake you. And encourage one another so we're not overtaken. Look out for one another. So let's be aware that even as believers in the Lord, we don't fall into an evil, unbelieving heart, as in verse 12. And that means we each have to be on guard to protect our souls from lies, including from false speech that comes our way. And the reason we should encourage one another is not only to avoid evil and unbelief but also our motivation should be the love of Christ this has been coming out over and over our motivation should be the love of Christ to encourage one another even and this came out on Thursday anytime you get stuck in your soul you know maybe you're even questioning the love of God just dwell on the cross sit back for a minute stop whatever you're doing for two minutes dwell about the cross about what he went through voluntarily for you. And then you'll re be reminded of the love of God for you. So this past week, God reminded us that we must always fall back on Christ's love as our strength. On the board, we saw Philippians 4.13 in the New King James Version. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's been the emphasis lately strengthens me. Who do you rely on for your strength? Do you try to muscle through it? Do you, you know, 
get macho and be like, I'm going to push through it? Or do you rather surrender in that moment and, and turn to Christ for strength and ask for his supernatural help? The message has been that if he is our strength, we are able to live in supernatural things like love and forgiveness. Truly miraculous things, really, when you think about it. Forgiveness is a miracle of the soul. I mean, when you're an unbeliever, you can't do it. Not truly. You can fake it. You can say the right things. But for your heart to really forgive someone who really hurt you, that's a miracle. That's the power of Christ in you. And with God, all things are possible. You can actually let it go if you rely on Christ for your strength is on the board. Here was a follow-up point that came out on Thursday. The Lord, my strength. We get his strength by faith in his love. This has been another major point over the last few lessons. Where does his strength come from? How do we access his strength? By having faith in his love for us. Even when we are bottom of the barrel that day, right? Even when we're just ugly, sinful, um, doubting. He's there and he's like, just turn back, right? Just turn back to me in faith. Have faith in my love for you. Yes, I still love you, even though you're doing what you're doing right now. or thinking what you're thinking right now. And that gives you strength to go on in his power, not in your own. We've seen many times uh, Psalm 18.1, Galatians 2.20, and Philippians 4.13 we just saw again. So turning your Bibles one more time to a tireless verse, Galatians 2, verse 20. Galatians 2.20, and bear with me as I just have some allergies this morning, so try to keep the sniffling down. So where are we? Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. By faith in his love. That's what gives us strength. You've heard the phrase, and this came out on Thursday too, love gives you wings. Well, if anything should, it's this verse. It's this concept. Have faith in his love. Look what he did at the end of verse 20, who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, God's love, when rightly understood, makes you fly in your soul. That's why we don't need to self-medicate. That's why don't we don't need things to, you know, appease our pain, right? Or, or entertain us all the time. Not if we rely on the love of God and what he did on the cross. If your perspective is right about that, you'll always be flying in your soul. So let's pray for more of that, shall we? Right? Lord, give me more faith. Let's simply make sure we hold on to faith in his love for us. Don't let it go. Again, on the board, the Lord, my strength, we get his strength by faith in his love. And all this has been a buildup to our main subject. And this key point for us all, this might be the last time we're going to see this point on the board, being righteous, having integrity, the quality of our speech is directly connected to the motivation of love. Don't underestimate this point. Carry this with you as we go forward and talk about fine speech. Motivation is everything, as we know. Here's a wonderful passage the Spirit inserted for us on Thursday. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1. Ecclesiastes 5, 1.
and see how many things you can recognize that we've been discussing the last couple of weeks. And we're going to read through this passage slowly and thoughtfully so we don't miss anything. Look at Ecclesiastes 5, 1. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they are doing evil. Notice these fools are sacrificing at the house of God. Why are they doing evil? Because they're not going there to listen. Verse 2, be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much busyness and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. <laughs> Let not your mouth lead you into sin. And do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. It's like the Spirit gave us a summary of the last ten lessons. If you've been keeping up with the lessons, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and you saw a lot of things in there all come together. So thank you to the Lord for that, because He's helping our souls understand and enjoy these truths. Like when we're able to put them together, does it not give you peace and joy? When you're able to see how these things work together, how to think rightly about these things? And we're going to get to that in a minute again. On Thursday, we noted Paul's fear and also love for the Lord. And that's what motivated him to follow his good conscience. We've seen Paul had an appropriate fear of the Lord and that it's appropriate for us all to have that fear of the Lord, not being fools who deny they need to fear the Lord. That's probably the most foolish thing on earth for a creature, a created being, to not properly fear the Creator. How appropriate is it to have this attitude? It's so appropriate that even the Lord himself in his humanity had this attitude towards his God and Father. So we saw this on Thursday too. We've got to take another look at this in Isaiah 11 verse 1. So go to Isaiah 11 1. Isaiah 11 1. This chapter is about the righteous branch. The righteous branch. Who is the righteous branch? It's a prophecy about the Messiah coming one day from the root of Jesse. If you don't know, Jesse was King David's father. And it describes what he will be like, as well as it describes the future millennial reign of Christ on the earth. But let's see what he will be like. What will the Messiah be like? We already know, but we keep learning about him, even from prophecies written hundreds of years before he was born. Look at Isaiah 11, 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. How can that be, right? Jesus is God in the flesh, and he's perfect. Why does he have to fear the Lord? He is the Lord. So what a message to us 
that in his humanity he delighted in fear of the Lord. As a man, he truly became human too. And he lived it out with every temptation coming his way, as we know. And he lived it out in humility, in the fear of the Lord. And we noted on Thursday, the Hebrew word for delight here, when it says, his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord, it means to be given quick understanding, which is a delight to the soul. When your eyes are open and you get something, you finally get something, and you're relieved and you're, and you're, you're happy in your soul. Remember this verse on the board, Psalm 111.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Why is that last part highlighted on the board there? His praise endures forever. Because when you get good understanding, you rejoice in your soul. When you know God, even a little bit better each day hopefully, you get joy and peace in your soul. So that's kind of the message, and Jesus is our great example as a man. Even though he was perfect, he still feared the Lord. How much more should we? So needless to say, the Lord Jesus had tremendous fear and reverence for his Father God in heaven as a man. And this verse tells us this, it was his delight. As we walk with the Lord... Reverent fear for him should be our delight, too. Like, it's easy from a natural mind to say, fear the Lord. Like, our natural mind looks down on that, doesn't it? Like, kind of like a negative. I have to fear the Lord, or why am I fearing the Lord if he loves me, right? You start trying to understand. And then you see it's supposed to be a delight. It's supposed to be like a pleasure. Maybe even a relief to know God that way. And to our next point on the board. Oh, the love and fear of the Lord. To know the creator of the heavens and the earth, the almighty one, who could wipe us out in a split second, but yet he loves us and is for us. That's the joy of the fear of the Lord. That's the delight of the fear of the Lord. You mean this one? who did all of this with his mouth just speaking a word, is on my side, is for me now because I'm with Christ? Yeah. That's the delight of a believer who has the fear in the Lord. The fool doesn't have that. But we can enjoy that. We're supposed to enjoy it. He proved his love at the cross. The Almighty One. The One who lets you breathe another day, right? The One who could wipe us out, but doesn't, and hasn't, loves us terribly, so much that he died on purpose for us. And this should take the pressure off of us when we admit that he's the only one worthy of praise and glory and honor and fear. Right? What did Jesus say in the Gospels? He said, don't fear man, right, who can hurt your body but not your soul. Fear him who can take your body and your soul and throw you in hell. And then he says, but aren't you more valuable than many sparrows? Right? That same God who could cast you in hell has that kind of power and authority, says you're more valuable than many sparrows. I love you. I'm going to provide for you. Why wouldn't I provide for you? I think it's Matthew 11. I'm not sure. but So have that perspective. Put that perspective on, on your soul. Guard your soul with that. Fear of the Lord is supposed to be a delight, a joy, because he's actually on our side, this amazing almighty one. So the next point on the board we've seen many times, being righteous, having integrity. Paul, in his appropriate fear of the Lord, took pains to maintain a clear conscience and we noted that the emphasis is on took pains. It's painful to do the right thing at times because we're going to be shunned for it, among other things. 
The Spirit also gave us this on Thursday to help us learn from Paul's good example on how to live for the Lord on the board. Again, about being righteous and having integrity. If we don't want to be disqualified, a la 1 Corinthians 9.27, then we need to start listening to our good conscience and stop listening to creature comforts as our objective. You know those whispers in your head about creature comforts? I can't give up that. I really need that. These things that you go to only for pleasing yourself, pleasing the flesh. They might not, might not even be bad things necessarily on their own, but you go to them to satisfy your flesh instead of seeking to please God and do something for the glory of God. We all do that, right? Well, if you don't want to be disqualified, start listening to your good conscience when it pricks you and says, ah, uh, you know the right thing to do right now. Stop doing that. Do this instead. Or it says, stop doing that, right? <laughs> I just reversed it. I'm supposed to reverse it. But you know what I mean. Listen to your good conscience. Pray. How about Ecclesiastes 5? When you go to the house of God, listen instead of offer the sacrifice of fools. How about when you pray? Listen instead of offering too many words. And ask God what he wants you to do. That might disturb your creature comforts. But otherwise you might be disqualified. We're here for God and not for ourselves, everybody. And we're all going to see the Lord face to face very soon. So make up your mind to go all in. And stop playing some kind of a religious game on the fence. As per the point on the board, if we don't want to be disqualified, then we need to start listening to our good conscience and stop listening to creature comforts as our objective. And this goes nicely with our next point on the board regarding integrity to the word. By faith, the righteous person doesn't move away from truth. And although it might hurt in the short term, they know God will bless them out in the long term. Romans 8.28, we've seen. God is good, my friends. He's for us. And he has a wonderful plan for us to fulfill, to walk in. And he loves us. And he promises to provide for those who follow him, even as we battle in the devil's world. Life's a battle, right? This is the devil's world according to the Bible. Ephesians 2.2, 2, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So we're, we're definitely in a real battle in the devil's world. But he promises to provide. So go forward in faith. The other point that's been coming out the last couple of lessons is walking by faith. Going forward by faith is the only way to see these things come to fruition in our lives. That's the only way we're going to see God's mercy acting upon us, right? Um, like Romans 8.28, all things work together for good for those who love God. The only way we're going to see that is if we love God. How do we do that? By faith in his love. And then see what happens. But you don't go forward by faith, you're going to miss out on a whole lot. You might even be disqualified from the rewards and blessings in heaven that God has designed for you. So all that was review of uh, last Sunday and Thursday, pretty much. So let's get back to our series on Proverbs 17 as we begin to explore what the Bible means about fine speech and uh, go back to Proverbs 17, 17, verse 7. Everyone's got that magic ribbon. That was the quickest, quietest turn ever. <laughs> so as we've talked about, the Spirit is certainly building up a foundation in our souls for this subject of fine speech to rest on, Right? Proverbs 17, 7, fine speech is not becoming to a fool, still less is false speech to a prince. We've seen that we are to be on guard for the fool and his persuasions. And again, Satan has no scruples. 
He will even use people that you love and their ungodly speech to plant evil in your souls and to try to draw you away from the faith. We've also been talking about being dignified as a believer in Christ, which we also saw in Proverbs. So turn back to Proverbs 30, verse 29. Proverbs 30, 29. Three things are stately in their tread. Four are stately in their stride. The lion, which is mightiest among beasts and does not turn back before any. The strutting rooster, the he-goat, and a king whose army is with him. As believers in Christ, we are to act and live in uh, dignity, humility, and even nobility. That's how we're to act because we've been adopted sons of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. By grace, the Lord has chosen us and made us royalty. So says the Word of God. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. So we should walk with our heads held high with dignity because the Lord lives inside of us. And he's made us brand new and different. Look at 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. In other words, have dignity as sons of God. Abstain from the passions of the flesh, which which wage war against the soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable see that word honorable Dig- dignity nobility even keep your conduct among the gentiles unbelievers honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers they may see your good deeds and glorify god on the day of visitation that's a great thing to think about folks because when we keep our conduct honorable and, and people still come at us and criticize us as believers in Christ, right? Maybe even calling us fools for following God. But then one day comes when the good deeds we've done and maybe the love we've shown them or the, even the forgiveness we've shown them come to the light, come to the forefront somehow by God's grace. And it's undeniable that you're in the right by being with God. And, and that is going to bring God glory and might even save some people in the end. Your good deeds will come out in the open eventually. But by faith, it takes time to be patient, to live honorably, so that there's nothing they can really accuse us of in terms of like doing evil. So this is all for the Lord. This is all because we love the Lord. That's why we do it. We're grateful. He loved us first. And so we walk in dignity with the Lord. While fools who are without the Lord, they have no choice but to live an undignified life in an undignified manner. They have no choice without the Lord and without his wisdom. As our dear pastor said a few weeks ago in our lessons, uh, I put this on the board for you, fools are undignified. Unwise people a.k.a. fools who disrespect the Lord, are inherently undignified. And if they propose to be otherwise, it's nothing more than a ruse or an avatar. Why? Notice the word inherently. 
undignified. That means it's within them. It's who they are. It's like they can't, they don't have a new nature in Christ yet. They can't be godly. They can't be dignified as the Bible speaks about. They can fake it. They can put on a really good impression. There's a lot of philanthropists in the world, right? They give millions of dollars to different things that are unbelievers. So they can act the part. They can even do good things. But where's their motivation? God looks at the heart, right? So just think about that. Anybody can put on a good face. Let's not fall for the fool's um, imposter-like impressions of a believer, even looking religious. Anyone can put on a good face. The Spirit had us take pause last Sunday to remember that no marriage is perfect. To stop idolizing the marriages of people that you see or know. Or even worse, idolize people you don't even know in the movies. And think that they're amazing. How foolish can we be, right? In many cases, we end up being shocked about what happened behind closed doors years later. So how silly of us to put them on a pedestal. Anybody, even people in your church family, that you, you say, oh, what a great marriage they have, right? Or you get jealous because you think what they have is perfect. N nobody's perfect. And why do that to yourself? Put them on a pedestal like that and stop appreciating what God's given you, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Married, unmarried, sick, healthy, rich, poor. How about appreciating what God has given you? But this is the kind of thing that takes us away. Looking at the good face that people put on and almost are expecting them to be perfect. That is foolishness. Have you ever seen a good person, someone you consider good, and you kind of think they don't have any sin in their lives? It might even be an unbeliever. You're like, that's a good man. He's just a good guy. You know, he's just, he's lovable. He's nice. He's always kind. Right? Then three years later, you find out he's in jail for three things. Right? And you're like, no way. What happened? You believed the front. You believed the image that was projected. While in his soul, he suffers from this thing called sin, as we all do. So be careful. Don't do that to yourselves or to others. And just a little reminder that I put on the board for you. Romans 3, 10 through 12. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. This includes us as unbelievers, right? Until we're made new by faith in Christ. Nobody's good on their own. Nobody should be put on a pedestal. So when a fool disrespects God and puts on their avatar to give you a false impression, don't buy the lie. And don't get jealous or depressed that you're not like them. So foolish. We are to be on guard for anyone that might be putting on a good face. And this doesn't mean to judge them, but it means don't put them on a pedestal and just ruin your day <laughs> for foolishness. So the flesh is really good at faking people out. Next point on the board, fools are undignified. The flesh produces expert liars. Expert liars that can fool you. That's how good they are at lying. And we also mustn't buy the lie of appearances. So I think this is where we left off on Thursday, but go to 1 Samuel 16. We haven't been here yet. Go to 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. Fools are undignified. They are. They have no choice but to be undignified because they're without God. The flesh produces expert liars. And we also mustn't buy the lie of appearances. 
So we're going to see a couple passages about appearances and not judging by the appearance. 1 Samuel 16, 6 through 7. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. This was Samuel choosing another king after Saul, one of Jesse's sons. We already read about Jesse, right? In Isaiah 11, one of his sons would live forever, would reign forever. The prophet Samuel looked on Jesse's sons, and in his flesh he thought the tall, strong-looking one was God's choice. But he wrongly judged by appearances here. Look at verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Two totally different things, right? This is why we have to be careful how we see. We like to see out of our eyes and see superficially. We like to see the top and not think anymore, right? To not um, even maybe examine someone's behavior or attitude. We like to see on the surface level. But God looks at the heart. Now, we don't have the ability to see other people's hearts. But we can pray about discernment. And the Bible says we'll know them by their fruit also. But we need to learn how to see spiritually. We need to pray about how to see like God sees so that we're not deceived by outward appearances. So we have to learn to think and live this way. On the board, again, fools are undignified. The flesh produces expert liars, and we also mustn't buy the lie of appearances. Go to 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. 1 Timothy 3, 1. Humidity is just carrying everything around, I think. Anyway, that's my excuse. First Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 3.1 But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good. Treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. Do you see it? They put on a religious avatar. They even go to the house of God and sacrifice the sacrifice of fools but they don't draw near to listen. Right? Ecclesiastes 5. Having the appearance of godliness in verse 5, but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins, and led astray by various passions. So now think about the undignified serpent. The Old Testament calls out these evil people as devouring widows and orphans instead of helping them. That's a common phrase in the Old Testament. And it reminds me of verse 6. For among them, these who appear to be godly, are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. In other words, they take advantage of people's weakness. And they do it in a creepy way because they put on a religious outfit to look godly. I am scared for those people during the judgment who knowingly do this for their own selfish gain. They put on an avatar of being religious or godly, and you can only think of Jesus accusing the self-righteous Pharisees of these same things. So look at verse 7. 
They're always learning, but never able to come or arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Jannes and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly, their foolishness, will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. No one gets away with anything, right? Eventually it all comes to light. So what if you, or, or I should say, what do you do if you realize that this has been you? In some way, shape, or form. Maybe you're a faithful churchgoer. Maybe you consider yourself faithful to the Word of God, but you've been living th in this way in some area of your life. What do you do? What if you've been living in these foolish ways, putting up a front of some kind, but having evil in your heart? Well, join the club. If you're totally honest, you've experienced that even while going to church at times. What if you see areas of your life, such as lying? Remember all the time the Spirit spent on lying? What if you've been turning a blind eye to that, but that's really who you are, even though you come to church? What do you do outside these four walls? Well, the answer to what to do if this is us, is found in Proverbs 30 once again. So go back to Proverbs 30, verse 32. We are capable of a lot of sins, and we love to ignore when we're doing them. We don't like to analyze ourselves or examine ourselves to see maybe where we're thinking wrongly or speaking wrongly, right, or doing wrongly. Proverbs 30, verse 32. What do you do if this is you? If you have been foolish, exalting yourself, or if you have been devising evil, put your hand on your mouth. Sounds like repentance to me, doesn't it? And here it starts with suppressing your false speech. Back to our main subject. Just stop talking. <laughs> Just stop lying, right? Put your hand on your mouth. For pressing milk produces curds, pressing the nose produces blood, and pressing anger produces strife. In summary, this is the Spirit's way of saying, don't push your luck. God is not mocked. Repent, turn around, stop doing that. <laughs> right? Remember Bob Newhart? Pastor brings him up once in a while, that old to come. Stop. Just stop it. You want some good advice? Just stop it. Anyway, God is not mocked. God is not mocked. Put your hand on your mouth if you've been being foolish. Instead of thinking and acting like a low life, clean yourself up. Make a choice to be dignified and be like royalty. Stand upright. Walk righteously in Christ, knowing that he gave himself up for you. On the board, be dignified and walk in the truth. That's like a big statement. Be dignified and walk in the truth. By faith, remember who you are in Christ and say, I'm not going to lie anymore, even if it hurts. It's between you and God. But if you've been being a fool in this area, repent. Because only the truth sets us free. Not just the truth of the Word of God. Living in the truth, right? Instead of lies. The more we lie, the more we're going to be in bondage. We become a low life too. And we suffer for it and we make others suffer for it. So again, on the board, be dignified and walk in the truth. 
by faith, remember who you are in Christ and say, I'm not going to lie anymore, even if it hurts me. Let the chips fall where they may. God will cover you back. Look again at Proverbs 30, verse 32. Proverbs 30, verse 32. If you have been foolish, exalting yourself, or if you have been devising evil, put your hand on your mouth. For pressing milk produces curds, pressing the nose produces blood, and pressing anger produces strife. So, as we begin to close our lesson today, the Spirit wants us to read, to read a chapter in the book of Proverbs. And it goes back and forth between righteousness and foolishness. Okay, that's what's interesting about it. Uh, so turn in your Bibles to Proverbs 16, verse 1. Proverbs 16. And every so often in this chapter, at a regular cadence, the Spirit throws in clearly stated doctrine. So keep your eyes open. Proverbs 16, 1. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord. For example, be all in. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. Once again, God is not mocked. Don't worry about it if someone's getting away with stuff. And you think, oh, they've got this great life and they're living in evil. Why are they so blessed? Don't worry about it. He will not go unpunished. And verse 6, By steadfast love and faithfulness, Iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. We're going to pause here at verse 6 for a minute. Let's remember on the board, oh, the love and fear of the Lord. Love is the great motivation that solves all of our problems. And remember, the Spirit has taught us in the past the close relationship between love and and fear, fear of the Lord. Psalm 103, and we just saw it in Proverbs 16, 6. And notice this passage in verse 6 tells us fear of the Lord, Lord turns us away from evil. Turns us away from evil. We should regularly ask the Lord to keep us from evil. It's even part of the Lord's prayer, is it not? At the end of the Lord's Prayer that he taught the disciples, deliver us from evil. So not only should we pray for that, because we need help, right? Who doesn't need help staying away from evil? But not only that, but fear of the Lord will keep you away from evil. Having the right perspective about God, and that includes love and fear of the Lord. They're both proper. They're both appropriate, and they're both closely related. So the more we develop a healthy fear of the Lord, even thinking of examples like Ananias and Sapphira we saw in, in Acts chapter 5, right, where they were, they died, they lied to the Spirit, and God took them out. Whatever it takes to remember that it's appropriate to have fear of the Lord, and that will help you turn from evil, as in verse 6. So our next point on the board before we go on, regarding fear of the Lord, this has also been coming out kind of intermittently in our, in our series. Fear of the Lord also includes a fear of not pleasing your Heavenly Father. That is a very good, healthy, righteous fear. Fear of the Lord also includes a fear of not pleasing your Heavenly Father. So that's like a righteous mentality, right? I don't want to let him down. All he did for me, I don't want to let him down. So let's read verse 6 one more time in your Bibles, Proverbs 16, 6. 
By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. Again, next point on the board. Oh, to love and fear the Lord. Love is the great motivation that solves all of our problems. And remember, the Spirit has taught us the close relationship between love and fear. That's for you to pray about and explore. I mean, Pastor taught on it a while ago, but it still a, appears to be an oxymoron, right? Love and fear appear to be opposites. Fear of, the, fear of man is opposite of love. But fear of God is righteous, is right in line with the love of God as our Heavenly Father. Psalm 103 and Proverbs 16, 6. Try reading Psalm 103 tonight before you go to bed and watch the peace you have going to sleep. Some of you have trouble going to sleep or your, your mind won't shut down or you worry a lot maybe. Try reading Psalm 103 and see where you're at in your soul. It talks both about the fear and love for the Lord. So let's finish up this chapter as we close out our message today. Look at Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. In other words, we can't seize blessings on our own. Verse 10, an oracle is on the lips of a king. His mouth does not sin in judgment. A just balance and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. It is an abomination to kings to do evil, for the throne is established by righteousness. In other words, this goes back to Proverbs 17, 7, doesn't it? It's not God's way for kings to be unrighteous or princes to speak with false speech. Verse 13. Righteous lips are the delight of a king, and he loves him who speaks what is right. A king's wrath is a messenger of death, and a wise man will appease it. In the light of a king's face there is life, and his favor is like the clouds that bring the spring rain. How much better to get wisdom than gold? To get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. The highway of the upright turns aside from evil. Whoever guards his way preserves his life. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's where we get the saying, pride comes before a fall. It is better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. Whoever gives thought to the word will discover good, and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. The wise of heart is called discerning, and sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. Good sense is a fountain of life to him who has it, but the instruction of fools is folly. The heart of the wise makes his speech judicious and adds persuasiveness to his lips. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. A worker's appetite works for him. His mouth urges him on. A worthless man plots evil and his speech is like a scorching fire. A dishonest man spreads strife, and a whisperer separates close friends. That reminds me of when the Spirit warned us to protect our families from outside influences. Again, verse 28. A dishonest man spreads strife, and a whisperer separates close friends. A man of violence entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. Whoever winks his eyes plans dishonest things. He who purses his lips brings evil to pass. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. 
The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. A lot of good stuff there, huh? Worth going home and reading again, maybe, and just seeing all the wisdom that is designed to set us free. So that's a good place to stop this morning. We'll continue with more on Thursday evening. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truth of your word that sets us free when we embrace it and we decide to believe it and to practice it. Father, unlike the fools of this world, we thank you for opening our eyes to the truth by your grace. We ask that you show us how to apply these things to our lives, Father, so that we don't end up living like the fool. That in humility we have fear for you because you are the Almighty One, the Creator of heaven and earth, who yet loves us and gave himself up for us. Father, we ask that you help us to spread your word and the good news to those among us, those who are lost and dying and don't realize it, don't realize they're playing the fool. We ask that you open their hearts and minds and use us to bring you glory. We ask all these things based on the merits of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and by the power of your Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you.